What would you say is the biggest mistake when it comes to dating? After seeing all of this, being around, doing what you do so well, and you're just like, huh, this is the biggest mistake. Yeah, it's um, judging too quickly. A lot of people go on the first date and they expect like crazy fireworks and to know <laughs> this is my person and I knew, and that's not really how it works. The best relationships, it's a little bit of a slow burn. So it's in that second date, third date, fourth date, where all of a sudden it clicks and the sparks there. So a lot of people are judging too quickly. They're expecting perfection on the first date. And then they're, if it's not there, they're giving up and they're moving on to someone else. But usually it does take a beat. What I've noticed about men and women is men know right away. Like on the first date, they're smitten and like they know right away if they're into you or not. I very rarely will push a man to go on a second date if he's not interested on a first date. This is interesting. So when I look at a lot of our success stories, mm -hmm. I'll analyze what was the original post-date feedback that we got. Almost every time the man is pretty sure. He, he at least is excited to go on a second or a third date and he's so happy. The woman is typically cautious. She's not 100% in. She likes something about him, but she's not... You know, she's a little bit concerned about this other thing, but she's willing to go out again. Wow. And then mm -hmm. it takes a handful of dates and she's all in. So the so I wouldn't usually push a man to go on a second date if he wasn't super interested in the first. Because they know. Because they pretty much know. Yeah. Okay, so before we wrap up, I just want some dating tips from you okay, because you sure. are the matchmaker yes. and this is what you do. Okay, how important is appearance on a first date? I would say it's very important on a first date. Are we vain? No, but you just have to show up. First of all, it doesn't have to be anything fancy, but you have to feel confident. So even if that means mm. you have two uniforms that you wear, but you feel confident in them, that's right. what you wear. But it is important. I'll tell you like a really short story. Yeah. We had this guy that we were working with and he was wealthy, but he didn't want people to know that he was wealthy. He didn't want to wear his fancy fair. watches. Totally fair but he would kept showing up in sweats. Mm -hmm. And so the women would say, I'm really interested. He's a really nice guy, but like the wardrobe is really throwing me off. So it really can make an impact. But again, it doesn't have to, you don't have to be fancy. You just have to feel confident showing up and being the best version of yourself. Can one night stands turn into a long lasting relationship? Yes, but it's incredibly rare. You, are, you will have a much higher chance of success if you wait. Okay. All right. So what you're saying, there is a chance. There is a chance. <laughs> <laughs> if it happens, don't beat yourself up. It yeah. can still work out. But if you can hold out, you'll have a higher chance of success. Talia Goldstein, thank you for being here thank today. Thank you for having me. We have so many questions about love. You are a dating coach, a matchmaker, a businesswoman, a mother. So many incredible accolades you have accomplished in your life. So I'm so happy that you took the time to be here today. Oh, this is so fun. Okay, so I want to talk about you being a dating coach. What does this okay. mean? What do you know about love? And yeah. how are you so good at giving advice and connecting people? And we are going to talk about that. But yes. how did how did this all happen? Well, it originally happened like years and years ago in high school, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I was always obsessed with love. So I'd set up these blind date parties, which is a weird thing to do in high school and just match people up. And then through my career, I worked in advertising and later television. Right. And I've just been connecting people. And then I realized I had this weird talent. A lot of the people I was connecting ended up in relationships. Hmm. So then I realized I had this talent and it could one day become a profession. So for fun, I started hosting parties around town just to bring everybody together. And the parties became pretty popular. We started with 20 people, then 300 people, 600 people. We were taking over these huge hotels around Los Angeles, like the London West Hollywood. And so through wow. that, I realized there was something missing in the market and all of these amazing, attractive, interesting, successful people were having trouble. So then I ended up leaving my job in TV and starting the company. Wow. Okay. So your company, Three Day Rule. Yes. You are a matchmaker. Your company is matchmaking 
people and helping them find love. All day, every day. <laughs> All day, every day. Okay, so how big is your team? We have 50 full-time matchmakers now across the country. So I started the company from Los Angeles, but now we're in 12 cities. Wow. We're doing nationwide matching and it's grown a lot, I think, partially due to dating app culture. It's yeah. so hard out there that more people are turning to matchmakers. It's miserable out there. It's rough. Well, that's why people need you. Okay. Yes. So now what if somebody's like, no, I want to work with Talia. How hard is that to happen yeah. now? Are you far removed from actually being the matchmaker because mm -hmm. you are the founder, you're the boss, you're busy making things happen, or are you still dabbling in matchmaking? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm definitely dabbling behind the scenes. That's for sure. I'm okay. way too in the weeds. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not really like my job anymore, but I'm so obsessed with it. I can't help. So all day, every day on the back end, I'm matching people. I'm calling the matchmakers. I have this perfect match. I am getting so creative to find matches out in the real world. So I do it all day, like just to be helpful. I take a handful of clients at a time and I usually right. partner with a VIP matchmaker. So I'm doing some but also part of my job is to do a lot of the intake meetings. So when people sign up, they're assigned a matchmaker and we get to know them and what they're looking for. So I'm on that team and I get to talk to oh, people wow. every single day to learn what they're looking for and also to help them prioritize their list. Like what are the non-negotiables? What are your must-haves, your deal breakers? So I do a lot of those calls. I'm like really in it still. You care. Oh, too much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what is the process? So a client comes to you and they sign up. Mm -hmm. What does that whole process look like? What do they have to go through to ultimately find love? Initial profile is like two minutes. Okay. You're assigned a matchmaker. So again, I'm on that team, but there are a handful of us. So we do the intake meeting and part of our job is just to make sure we can deliver. We don't want to work with anyone unless we really feel we can have success. Mm. So we'll... Hopefully we can take you on. If not, we can refer you to another matchmaker out there who likely can help. If we can match them and they're interested in becoming a client, then they sign up and we pair them with a the matchmaker. Mm -hmm. So I'm the matchmaker for the matchmakers. I get to pick the right person so cool. to work with them. Right. And then we get to know so much information, all your backstory, your parents' marriage, your goals, the timeline, your core values, who you find attractive. We make you send photos of exes. And people wow. that you find attractive <laughs> so we can see what the themes are. It's just easier to see visually than to have you right. describe it. So we get all this information. And then the matchmaker's job is to go through our network and also outside of the network to find anyone who could be a fit and then interview them. So we're like essentially going on your first dates for you and then mm. making sure everything aligns. Once we have someone that's a fit, we send over to the client and we share a lot. They'll see pictures. Mm -hmm. We tell them all about the match. Then they go on the date. And after we collect feedback from both sides, that is the most valuable part of the service, I think, because you get to learn how you're coming across on a date. And everyone has blind spots. Whoa, 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 whoa. I need details. <laughs> so you might go on a date and okay. think you're showing interest, but you're not. Like the other person doesn't know that you're interested. And so you don't get the second date. <gasps> so it's little like tweaks and tips like that that end up making such a huge difference. There's a lot of miscommunication on dates, a lot of assumptions. So Ooh. we're the liaison. We're able to say like, this is how you came across. Your date really liked you. Like, go ahead and ask out on a second date. Oh, wow. Okay. So this process is really going to help you understand whether or not it's going to go further. So it's not just mm -hmm. a, oh, here's somebody mm -hmm. that, you know, on paper you match with, boom, you're done. Now figure it out on your own. There is kind of a, a follow up to this. Like, okay, yes, a second day is on the horizon or no, this person doesn't think it's a match. Like right. you break the bad news. Exactly. And here's Ouch. why it's not a match. And let me tell you why and what you can improve on or what we can do differently or how to share this information in the future. It's so helpful. <gasps> and then the person can either pause and focus on that one match yeah. or we can continue to send other matches. And it can be an iterative process where we're making really small changes along the way. Right. So you might go on the date and say, yes, okay, you gave me everything I asked. Now I realize this other thing's important. So then we have to go back to the list and make some changes and interview a new group of people. And so usually what happens is people come with this initial criteria. Okay. And they end up marrying someone a little bit different. But we have to make these really small changes along the way to figure that out. So typically they end up marrying someone a little outside of their comfort zone. Oh, 
This is so interesting. It is. It's a bit of psychology behind it, right? So much. Because we don't know these things as daters. Like usually when you're online dating, for example, you're just swiping on what's familiar. Right. But that's not necessarily what's best for you. Right. And so Correct. you just keep going out with the same type <laughs> yes. of person over and over and you're not making progress when actually you're perfect. You might be swiping right past your soulmate. Right. Wow. Okay, so tell me about the title, Three Day Rule. That's the name of your company. Where does this come from? Is this applicable in dates? Like, is this the rule that people should be following? <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> okay, so don't follow Do the rule. Do not follow the rule. It's actually from the movie Swingers. Okay. Vaughn. Yeah. <laughs> I just loved the name. It me, What they did in the movies, they would wait three days after getting a girl's phone number so they didn't come across as desperate. Right, which is something that we've all heard for a very long time. Uh, yes, people think that there are rules in dating. There are no rules. Okay. Yeah, I am not a fan of rules. I think it's not one size fits all. Right. Yeah. So definitely don't follow the three-day rule. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, so... Now, when we think of a matchmaker, when I think of that, I think of Hitch, the film. OK, yes. so is that basically what you're doing? A hundred percent. Yes, we are definitely like the real life Hitch. Yeah. And we are so helpful. So the first part of our job is to set you up with the right person. OK. And we're using your core values and personality. And there's so much that goes into it. But then we need to help you navigate the relationship as much as you'll let us. Some people go on three, four dates. and They're like, I'm good. I'll see you at the wedding. But other people really want our help in navigating the relationship. And so we do that as long as you want. And in many cases, we've done it through engagement. Like there's a hiccup right before they're getting engaged and we're helping them navigate just to get them to the finish line. <gasps> okay, so this is a really big difference between the work that you're doing, your company's doing and dating apps, because I mm -hmm. want to talk about, okay, well, what makes the difference here? But this is, you're actually getting advice inside or at least guidance, right? Mm -hmm. Depending on who the client is and if they want to receive that guidance or not, you are helping them get to the finish line. Yes, definitely. It's a huge difference. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's not just matchmaking. It's also coaching. And yes. I think that is amazing. And that really sets you apart from dating apps. Definitely. And each client that comes to us, they get a matchmaker and that's their like day-to-day -day coach. They actually also get a separate coach. What? Yes. To dig even deeper. Like if they're finding patterns or blocks that are coming up, it's a little bit like therapy. So they work with a separate person who's their dating coach. Uh -oh. And often it's talking about like attachment style or vulnerability or even like flirting techniques. So they go deeper with that coach. And then we do a photo shoot with them. So we take new pictures. It's a really holistic approach, which is obviously very different from the dating apps. Oh my, okay. See, I think this is really important to know because I was gonna ask you, how has the landscape changed when it comes to dating because of dating apps? Yeah, I think dating apps have made dating so much harder. Yes, I agree. Like on one hand, you have access to millions of people you wouldn't sure. otherwise meet. Great, that's the benefit, but people are always looking for the bigger, better deal. Yes. And the apps are so tricky because you might be going out there really looking for marriage where the person you're on the date with is looking for something casual, right. or maybe they're still in a relationship, but they just wanted to feel it Listen, out. Right. So it's incredibly time consuming. The average online dater spends 12 hours a week online. It's like a part-time job. So you're wow, going that's on, a lot of time. It is so much time and so demoralizing and frustrating and exhausting because you're putting yourself out there. You're going on these dates and then in two seconds you realize you don't align on the basics. Mm -hmm. So it feels like such a waste. You think it's a numbers game, but it's actually not because what you should be doing is intentionally dating the right people. So you're better off going on fewer, better dates with a matchmaker, or right. even if you're dating online, like really dating intentionally than to think it's a numbers game because it's not. Okay, so this is really interesting. We're getting to a point here. Okay, so the work that you're doing like if someone comes to you, they're probably going to save time, right? Because you're the company. This is part of the service. Yes. The groundwork of doing all this is handled by you guys versus when you're online, you're doing the work yourself. So you are spending all those hours on it versus probably taking care of yourself, right? Because yes. we hear how you should love yourself and self-care is most mm -hmm. important. And that's what, you know, if that's the energy you put out, that's the energy you're going to get. So 
all the time that people are spending on dating apps, it's probably cut in half or whatever it is if they're going yeah. through a matchmaking company like yours. Yeah, that's exactly it. So in dating, you're either going to pay with your time or there your money. Is. There it is. So you can pay with your time and spend the 12 hours a week online dating. And probably at some point you're going to meet your person. Sure. Or you pay financially and matchmaking can be an investment, but right. then you save all the time and you're going on those fewer, better dates. This totally makes sense. Okay, so who comes to you? Mm -hmm. Is it the person that wants to find marriage? Is it the casual dater? What would you say is the person that's seeking out your services? Usually it's successful, busy professionals who are ready for a relationship. So typically they focused on their career and now they're ready to settle down. Like they're in that stage and they want to meet other people who are looking for a serious commitment. That's the demo. We work with a wide range, it's like 20 sure. to 80 like LGBTQ. Like, but the theme is successful, busy professionals. <laughs> this is so good to know. <laughs> okay. Can you share roughly on average, how much somebody would spend if they go and they want your services? Like mm -hmm. how much should they be saving before they come to yes. you? Yes. So the client side starts at 5,900. Mm -hmm. That we work with people usually three months or six months, but it starts at 5,900. That's a lot of time that you're working with somebody. Yeah. So 5,900 is for three months and then it goes up to, you know, right. six months. We have year packages. So that is to work one-on-one -on -one with a matchmaker, which I highly recommend if you can fit it in your budget. If you can't, you can always sign up for the free version. Anyone can sign up for free to be matched with our clients, to be eligible to be matched. So nothing to lose by just joining the database. Wow. Okay. So where do they go? Like, how does someone yeah. sign up? Tell it's, us. You go to three day rule.com. Okay. You have to spell out three. Okay. <laughs> because I forgot to pay the GoDaddy subscription <laughs> on the number. It's three day rule. So, so now it's an eighties cover band. So <laughs> <laughs> you go to three day rule.com and yeah. you just create a profile. It takes two minutes. That is awesome. <laughs> okay. So how do you know if someone is a good matchmaker. Mm -hmm. And when yes. you are recruiting people to be part of your company, you're like, okay, yes, this is, I feel like you're gonna be a good matchmaker. Mm -hmm. It's all soft skills. So mm -hmm. it's really challenging to look at a resume and know like you're gonna be the best matchmaker. Interesting. It doesn't translate too much. Sometimes they're therapists or maybe they were recruiters mm -hmm. and that's pretty similar, but usually just ultimately comes down to soft skills. So it's in the interview process that we can really figure out, like, do you genuinely care? Do you have great intuition? How would you handle certain situations? So that's how we figure out who would be the best. Were there people that wanted to be ma a matchmaker and you're just like, no, you don't get it? Like, what was there a major red flag that you were just yeah. like, no, that's. Mm -mm. It's usually in how they handle the, the clients, like the right matchmaker knows there's like two sides to every story. And that even if they're acting this certain way, it's stemming from something else. So right. we have to give our clients the benefit of the doubt. So it's usually people who just are like warm and mm -hmm. genuine and they realize there's a lid for every pot, you know, mm -hmm. and they want to get their clients like all the way to the finish line. How did you being good at the work that you do, being a matchmaker, naturally being just mm -hmm. good at connecting the dots. How did that help you personally? Did you find yourself just being really good at dating or do you feel like, okay, I went through my, you know, trials and tribulations and that's, you know, it refined my <laughs> matchmaking skill set. I feel like I've always been a pretty good dater. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, first of all, I was very proactive and I'm a huge fan of being proactive. So almost every guy I've dated and I have dated a lot, I did the work to get the first date. So even when I met my husband, I walked into a party, I saw him across the room and I turned to the guy next to me. I was like, bring him to me, bring him over. And Let's so go. I just orchestrated go, the whole you. thing. <laughs> And I'm so glad I did because he's kind of an introvert. There's no way he would have approached me. And so I just figured it out for myself. But almost every guy I've dated, I've been that way. I've always asked for the first date. That's how I handled it. And then after that, I made it more traditional. So I would just land the first date and then I'd take a step back and it was on them to ask for the second or third. So in that way, I was always pretty great at dating. Yeah. And I try to help my female clients especially be proactive. I always say, if you see someone in person or even online, 
approach them and do what you can to get that first date and then you can take a step back. But so often the guys don't even know you're interested and a lot of men have faced a ton of rejection. So they're not going up to people as much I think as they used to. So if you are interested, you really have nothing to lose. Like just at least show interest. So they might ask you out. You know what, for a long time, we've heard it and I've been programmed this way, right? We've been socialized to think like, oh, don't make the first move on the guy. The guy should be the one to make the first move. But I think those times are done Mm -hmm. if they even really existed. But I think those times are done. And I think online dating makes it harder just because it's like, how do you know if someone's even interested in you anymore? So I do think you have to give a little bit of a sign Mm -hmm. of something. Yes. Just something. Yeah. Even if you're not going all the way to ask the person out, just somehow show interest. And it can be as easy as like if you're having a conversation, let's say music comes up. Right. Oh, my gosh. So and so is coming into town. We should go sometime. Right. Like Just somehow drop a hint that you would like to see them again. Right. It doesn't have to be like, hey, I'm really into you. Yes, and I exactly. want to marry you. And I, right. want to <laughs> I think there's like subtle ways there's to show your in interest. Yeah. Definitely. The okay. other thing, just going back to my dating life. Yeah. I was always pretty open and I focused a lot more on personality and core values. So like so many of the guys I dated who were the best ever were five, five. You know, I wasn't always going for like the six foot guy, which a lot of women are like they're focused on really superficial things like height is a big one. Really? And when you look at the numbers, 14% of men in the U.S. are over six feet tall. We assume half are single. So when you limit in that way, your pool is now 7%. Then you add on some form of education right. and location. And now you're down to like three men in your city. <laughs> so that is part of the problem with dating is these long like shopping lists. Yeah. So you, we were even talking before the camera started rolling how someone living in a different city, depending how far that city is, can determine whether or not they're going to date somebody because traffic, because mm-hmm. just times are different now. So you obviously your business starting in L.A., how big? Big of, I guess, like a factor is that when it comes to dating, the proximity of somebody living near them. And what does that mean? Yeah. So it's interesting because it's obviously ideal to have someone within like a few miles so you can see them all the time. And people complain in L.A., especially about traffic going like it can be an hour or so. That said, during COVID, a lot of people started dating outside of their city because they were doing virtual dating. Right. And that actually was pretty helpful. So Hmm. if and people are used to it now. So a lot of our clients are asking for a nationwide search or they'll pick a handful of cities that they visit. And so we're matching them outside of their city. So if you're someone that feels like you've dated everyone in the city or you've seen everyone on app, just open up to another location and it could make a huge difference especially as people can work remotely, it's much easier to bounce around. That totally makes sense. But that also makes it harder, right? I feel like it's like a selection thing in the sense of like when you have so many options, that's what I feel like is also a problem with like the internet when it comes to dating and online dating. Sometimes it's like, oh, there's just too many options. So how do you narrow it down? Like when, (laughs) let's say client comes to you, they sign up, do you hand them 50 Mm-hmm. options, a hundred options. Like yeah. how does that look like? Or what's the sweet spot? I think like scientifically nine is where you max nine. out. Like you can, once you're nine, like, and that's what happens with online dating. So if you are online, you should focus on nine max and just see them through. And if it doesn't work out, go back out again. With us, we present one at a time. And usually it's about one a month. It can be a little bit more, but we say one a month. Meanwhile, we may have interviewed 100 people to get to that one. We're doing all of that work. Correct. Because so many people look amazing on paper, but you interview them and you can tell it's not a fit. Right. So that's our job. We're going through all like the heavy lifting. And then when we have someone we're excited about, then we present to you. So you see one at a time and you can focus on that one person and not get distracted. Has anybody come to you wanting an open relationship, right? Mm -hmm. And they're like, hey, look, I I want a relationship, but I want many relationships. I want an open relationship. Is that something that you guys would help them Mm -hmm. find? Someone who's compatible, who also wants that as well? Or how does that work for you? It's definitely becoming more popular. I see a lot in the Bay Area. 
Oh, the bay. Okay. Yeah, they're like <laughs> they want to be free. I'll call into open relationships. We don't work with those clients, but I'm happy to refer them to somebody who does. Wow. So there are matchmakers who specialize in that. Yeah. And helping people matchmake with other people who want to be open yeah, or open just relationship, swingers or whatever it is. Exactly. Yes. Wow. Do you ever see yourself adding those services to your company? We might when we have enough people to match them with. Got it. Yeah. Okay. So how do you determine success mm -hmm. when you are matchmaking? Success for us is when they leave. We're working with people for a short amount of time. So when they leave finding chemistry with someone that we've paired them with, but also success is actually based on what success means to the client. So people come to us at all different right. stages. Some are fresh out of a divorce and they just want to practice dating again. Mm. They haven't dated in 30 years. So we'll, of course we're going to pair them appropriately, but success for them means getting back out there. Others don't have a ton of dating experience. So success is walking away a more confident dater, learning about themselves. Right. And then for others, it's marriage or marriage and kids. So it's dependent on what they're looking for. That's how we'll determine success. But our job, like, is to try to get them into a relationship by the time that they leave. Oh, so sweet. Oh, love <laughs> is so beautiful. What's the one thing that you're looking for when you want to help someone find love? Like the one thing you're just like, I need this to be present in order mm -hmm. for this to actually be successful or as successful yeah. as it's going to mm -hmm. be. Well, the clients that we love working with are the ones that come in with an open mind mm -hmm. and they're willing to trust the process and they're willing to be surprised. Those are the best because we've seen just through like hundreds and hundreds of success stories that the clients that end up engaged, married are usually with someone in a little bit of a different package than they expected. So those are the best clients to work with. The toughest clients are the ones that are really rigid in their thinking. Like he has to make X amount of dollars and be this height and this, this, yeah. like they're convinced that they're person. So we can deliver that to them, but usually it doesn't work out because that's not who they're meant to be with. Wow. Ouch. Okay. So what <laughs> happens are you, they must be shattered when they realize <laughs> what they wanted, their list of must haves is really not what they need. Yes. How do people handle rejection? Well, sometimes what we'll do is trick them a little bit. Uh -huh. <laughs> that's probably not the best way to say it, but we'll present two matches at the same time. Mm -hmm. So we'll say, here's the one that you want. He meets everything you're looking for. And mm -hmm. here's the other one that doesn't meet that, but we really think could be a fit for you. And then they'll go out with both and our guy will ultimately win or our girl will win. Wow. So then it's through the process that they'll start trusting us a little bit more. What would you say is the biggest mistake when it comes to dating? After seeing all of this, being around, doing what you do so well, and you're just like, huh. This is the biggest mistake. Yeah. It's um, judging too quickly. A lot of people go on the first date and they expect like crazy fireworks and to know this is my person and I knew. And that's not really how it works. The best relationships, it's a little bit of a slow burn. So it's in that second date, third date, fourth date where all of a sudden it clicks and the sparks there. So a lot of people are judging too quickly. They're expecting perfection on the first date. And then they're, if it's not there, they're giving up and they're moving on to someone else. But usually it does take a beat. How about for men? What's the biggest mistake that they're doing when it comes to dating? And don't worry, we'll talk about women too. Yeah. But in your experience so far. That's a good question. Men are a little bit easier. Are they really? <laughs> they can be. They're simple. Men, I mean, in a positive way. I'm <laughs> yeah, saying in a positive, that. I get it. Yeah. But they usually their lists are shorter. Um, what I've noticed about men and women is men know right away, like on the first date, they're smitten and like they know right away if they're into you or not. I very rarely will push a man to go on a second date if he's not interested on a first date. This is interesting. So when I look at a lot of our success stories, mm -hmm. I'll analyze what was the original post-date feedback that we got. Almost every time the man is pretty sure. He, he at least is excited to go on a second or a third date and he's so happy. The woman is typically cautious. She's not 100% in. She likes something about him, but she's not, you know, she's a little bit concerned about this other thing, but she's willing to go out again. Wow. And then mm -hmm. it takes a handful of dates and she's all in. So the, so I wouldn't usually push a man to go on a second date if he wasn't super interested in the first. Because they know. Because they pretty much know. I think wow. as far as helping men, I mean, 
A lot of it comes down to communication mm -hmm. and texting and over texting and just <laughs> like making sure that the way that they're setting up the date is pretty seamless. Mm -hmm. Like calling, offering a plan, you know, at least a couple options, not leaving it up to the girl. Like, where would you like to go? It's about being assertive and yes, and just making it easy. In general, mm -hmm. do guys know whether or not they're going to marry someone right away or does it take a little bit of time? So... The men don't know right away, like this is a person they're going to marry, but they know if they're excited or not. And that's enough of an indicator to keep at least going down this route. Yes. And so ultimately, the couples that end up in a relationship, you look back at the original feedback and the guy was like, yes, thank you, matchmaker. She was so amazing. And I love this about her. And I can't wait to go out again. What is the one thing that guys, I guess, on their list of must haves mm -hmm. or whatever, what's something that's... A, a a common through line yes. with their lists. Usually they're short. They're <laughs> short. Okay, to short. The girls. <laughs> okay. So they want someone they're attracted to. Okay. That's, so it tends to be more important for the man than the woman. I was going to ask, where does this rank on their list of, yeah, it's their short pretty list of high up. It's, it's high, high up. up. Okay. Who they find attractive. Okay. They want someone they can respect. Okay. They want someone passionate about something. And that can mean many things. It might be their job. It might be yoga, could be helping animals, just something that they're passionate about. I think it shows independence. And then wow. typically they'll ask for s some personality trait, like either someone warm and nurturing or maybe someone a little fiery. Like they'll have one personality trait that they are excited about. Okay. And how, that's it. And that's it. Okay. <laughs> how about women? They want it all. <laughs> they, they want someone successful, at least as successful as they are, if not more, that's their ideal. And then also someone they find attractive and someone who they can bring around their friends. Usually they'll make sure they have a social circle, someone that they can like look up to with drive, ambition, good family, you know. The list is it, going. It's long. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's long. long. It's long. And there, it's all perfectly reasonable and sure. fine to ask for. It's just so interesting that the Men usually list two, three, four things. The woman usually yeah, have 100. 15. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So we talked about how men, it's high up on their list, them being attracted to somebody. Yes. What is high on the list of like women? What um, matters to yeah. us? It's financial stability. Okay. It's yeah. clear. It's Get pretty straight clear. to the point. Understood. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And so, also it's obviously like, oh, sorry. Yeah. Do they want kids? A lot of it has to do with religion and political views. So there's so much more. Really? Do people list like political views and if that matters to them? Yes. But only over the last like four or five years. Now it used this to is not be an issue. Like it was really? a non-issue. And now we have these categories, must-haves, nice-to-haves, and deal breakers. So a lot are listed under deal breakers. Like if you supported X, you're out. <gasps> Okay, what other deal breakers are there? Other ones are pretty more typical. Okay. Like smoking sure. or certain level of education. Sure. But, but political views political is a new is a thing major on there. Theme. Okay. All right. It's a new yes. world. It's okay, a new, new world. world. <laughs> okay. So I saw that you worked with the Kardashians. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. That was a moment. Was I so saw fun. it. Yeah. Okay. So you worked with the Kardashians to help Scott find someone. Yes. And if I remember correctly, her name was Celine, mm -hmm. right? The yes. person that you guys matched him up with. Okay, so tell us a little bit more about this. This is exciting. And how intimidating were the Kardashians when it comes oh. to finding love? Or were they the sweetest? <laughs> they were actually so fun. That's great. I think they would make great matchmakers. So our job was to present them with women that met Scott's type right. and that we think could be a fit. And then they were ultimately the matchmakers. So it was Chris and Correct. Chloe yeah. that interviewed all the women and then they chose Celine to meet Scott. That is so interesting. Okay, so how was that working with them? And what did you realize, if you can share, what was important for them when, mm -hmm. I guess they were being matchmakers part two, right? Because yes. like initially you're coming in, you're bringing this information and then they're sifting through it as well. What mattered the most to them? when it came mm -hmm. to matchmaking Scott? Well, originally what they were asking for is someone age appropriate. Mm -hmm. That was something that we were working on. 
But I think ultimately it came down to personality and core values. They really seemed to genuinely care. I wanted to help Scott sure. find love. So it was just finding the right person that would bring out the best in him and also fit in well with the family. And does that happen, I guess, in other situations where family members are also the matchmakers in addition to the work that you're doing? Like, is that a good practice to have or no? I guess it would depend yeah. on the family, right? Like, are they successful in their own relationships and stuff like yeah. that? But do you prefer a client to have a support system helping them mm -hmm. when it comes to matchmaking? Sometimes parents or siblings will pay for their relative to sure. go through matchmaking, which is so kind and helpful. Right. The problem is sometimes they're a little too involved. And so they want the matchmaker to produce what they want for the relative. Right. And it can put a little bit too much pressure on the client. Mm -hmm. And it makes it so the search is actually whoever the person's paying for, like what they're looking for. Right. And I think part of the problem of dating is that we're looking at all these other outside factors for who we should be with. So Disney movies mm -hmm. and what our parents are looking for and our friends. And right. so we have all this outside data that's infiltrating. And so we're not able to really figure out who should we be with? And right. ultimately, we're the ones that have to live with this person and sleep with this person right. and spend the rest of our lives. So it really should be our choice. So sometimes when you're bringing in outside factors like a parent or a sibling, it just can complicate the process. So you're not a fan of it? I'm a fan of paying for your child and then <laughs> stepping away. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, so with Scott, how was it? Were, was Chris and Chloe still involved or were they really more... Uh, Okay, well now we'll take a step back. How did they balance this? From from our perspective, we sent them the matches. They right. went through the interview process. They picked the one. And I think they were really rooting for her. Right. And then Scott went on the date and it was ultimately his decision. Right. I actually don't know exactly what happened right. post the date. Um, but I know they had a really, they did have a good time together. Good. I was going to ask, what happened? Do we need to watch the rest of the season to find out? <laughs> I don't before? know if it's going to pop up again, but right. I do know that they both enjoyed each other's company and it right. was a solid first date. I think more than anything, what it was showing is that he was open-minded. And I think that's probably, if I had to guess without knowing them, that was probably Chris and Chloe's goal is to get him to be open-minded to just, you know, seeing other types of, you know, opportunities, maybe check someone out that you wouldn't have before yes. or whatever it is. Yes. Just, I think the goal was to be open-minded. Yeah. And they played the matchmakers after the date because Scott talked a little bit about his post-date feedback. And in that conversation, he was assessing like, this is what I liked about her. And this surprised me. And it's really, that's and so good. Analyzing that is so important right. versus what a lot of people do is they just move right on to the next person without really assessing how they felt. I feel like you should match me Kim now. I'm ready. Right. Like, I mean, at this point, <laughs> is there a celebrity that you feel like, oh, yeah, I would be a great matchmaker for them. Oh. <laughs> and I would love to just partake in any way. Have you thought of that at all? I do slide into a lot of DMs. Do you really? <laughs> yeah. I'm obsessed right now. I love this. So I do it all the time. <laughs> you I, really love matchmaking. I, I love know. that. I do. <laughs> You're like, I think I know. I think I got this figured out for you. Yes. Okay. I know. Well, it's so... I don't have this anymore, yeah. but I really do believe that people have types. And so we used to have facial recognition where I could pop somebody's like X into the system and we could see other people that look like them. And I got that a lot through celebrities because I would look at who they dated and every person looked the same to me. Like they had the same facial structure or something in the eyes, even if they their were different. eyebrows, the yes. structure of, yeah. Like uh -huh. they could be totally different ethnicities or body types, but something in their face was always very similar. And so that's how I got the idea. Again, we don't have it any, we don't use that anymore. Now we just eyeball it. Right. Um, but I but I did find, if you look at celebrities and who they've dated, they usually date the same person over and over. Wow. Okay, wait. So are you basically trying to improve their ex? So you're trying to get someone <laughs> who kind of looks like their ex because they were obviously attracted to them. Yes. But with a better personality, you're just <laughs> more to offer. It's just someone that they would find attractive. Correct. And again, it could, it's like the eye shape or in their smile. Right. Like there's some things that we can 
pick up, like we'll ask everyone, send photos of their exes. Right. And so many people will say, I'm going to send them, but they don't look anything alike. And then I get the pictures and they're identical. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So you've actually worked with technology, AI, which I would think is, you know, the enemy for the Mm -hmm. work that you do, but you have, you've worked with Amazon, you've worked with Alexa when it Mm -hmm. came to giving dating advice. I think that was 2018 you created. That's right. We had dating tips through Alexa. Right. Dating tips that um, you created this program with Amazon and you would ask Alexa for dating tips and you Mm -hmm. guys were right there to help. Okay. So tell me how you do use technology in the work that you do Mm -hmm. and how are you not scared of AI taking over your job like the rest (laughs) of us? I mean, it's hard to be a matchmaker. So I, I'm not sure AI can do the job, but maybe it can get you so far. We haven't really played with AI too much, but we, we built our own system in house and we have a lot of filters, but then also we have so much data on who ends up becoming a successful match that we can use that to help our searches. Interesting, okay. Cause what would you say is the biggest difference between a dating app and what you do? Mm -hmm. A real human (laughs) matchmaker. I mean, a dating app is basically like shopping. Mm -hmm. And I do think you can find your person online. It just is gonna be incredibly time consuming and challenging and you have to be up for the challenge and make sure you go in with an open mind. So right. try to swipe right more right. than you're swiping left. Um, but the matchmaking is just helpful to have a third party help you, especially an expert, see through your blind spots and help you become a better dater and learn about yourself. I think we just ultimately save you a ton of time and energy mm-hmm. and you end up being a lot more present on the dates because you're going on fewer, better dates. So you can right. really bring your best version. Mm-hmm. We're online dating. It's exhausting. So you're not always bringing the best of yourself. And you're also giving coaching along the way, which I think is extremely beneficial than a dating app because You know, I think a lot of times when we're dating and we're out here, we're asking our friends the same questions and we're kind of just, you know, pulling from the same group and hearing it from a dating coach, right? Along the Mm -hmm. way, hearing things that maybe you don't want to hear, but you need to hear it, I think is extremely beneficial. A dating app isn't going to tell you that. It's so true. And a lot of what we do is tough love. Like we truly love you and we want you to end up in a relationship, but you're Friends won't give that to you. Right. And and usually they're not the best at giving love advice. Love advice. Because you'll come back and say, Oh, he didn't call he he showed up like 30 minutes late to the date. And they're like, Oh girl, get him out of here. Right. He is He's not done. right for it's you. Done. He, he doesn't done. respect you. He hates you. Yeah. So they're very quick to <laughs> shoo like people out of your life where we get to see both sides. We know so much more right. about the person. And so it's just helpful to have a third party that doesn't know you as well. Exactly. That's not so invested. That's not always going to take your side, even when you're wrong. Yes. Your friends love you and they want the best they for you. They want to protect you. <laughs> they don't always give the best advice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I think I'm a decent matchmaker. I think actually I'm a great matchmaker, Amazing. to be honest. My best friend, Katrina, I helped matchmake her and her current partner for a very long time. I'm the reason that they're together now. It's uh-huh. been a 14 maybe years at this point. Wow. They have a baby together. So and I just want to say as an unofficial matchmaker, <laughs> I feel very underappreciated by them. <laughs> I do. I feel like- You changed they, their life. I changed their life. They didn't even give their daughter like my name. Like <laughs> I felt like oh, give her a nickname and yes. let it be like Nessa something. You know, Completely. nothing. Do you feel underappreciated <laughs> when it comes to matchmaking? It's so, funny. so usually I feel very appreciated and they'll reach back out. But sometimes we'll match couples. They'll go on to get married, to have kids and never tell us. See, that's Katrina. That's <laughs> literally Katrina. And I feel so, I don't know. I just feel a way about oh, yeah. it. Yeah, No, you changed her life. And by Absolutely. the way, we're hiring. So call me. Okay, so I'll be there because I feel so just underappreciated and 
I don't know. I, I just feel like Katrina, who you spoke to, you know, Katrina, like that's who you were in oh, communication okay, with. Yeah. So Katrina owes me her life and she 100%. doesn't even care. Wow. She doesn't even care. Like it's just, it's, it's so, so dis- interesting. <laughs> it's so disrespectful. Okay. So I want to talk about you as a businesswoman because okay. there was some information that just completely blew me away that there was a time when you were obviously seeking investors and trying to get mm-hmm. investment and when you were going to these meetings, you covered up your pregnancy because you didn't want to be discriminated against because mm-hmm. we know the stigma around like just women in general, but let alone a, a pregnant woman and how we are viewed as in the workplace. Yes. Okay. Tell me about this. Cause my heart broke. Oh, it was so sad. So we think that, but not only that, I read it from uh, an investor that I really looked up to oh, no. in Los Angeles, wrote a blog right when I got pregnant. And it was all about how he was thinking about investing in a female CEO, but he was nervous that she was going to get pregnant and then not follow through with the company. And he wrote all of his thoughts out. So it was actually after I read that blog where I realized I cannot share this information or I'm not going to be able to get funding for the company. And so it was summertime and I was very pregnant wearing trench coats and these big baggy (laughs) clothes like showing up. And so we were able to raise the funding. I actually didn't even tell my co-founder at the time Mm. because I didn't want her to walk in and not feel confident in the meetings. So I hid it from everyone. Mm -hmm. And then after we raised the funds, I told her and ultimately my investors. And it was interesting. I ran into one of my advisors at a coffee shop Mm -hmm. pregnant. And that was the first time he saw. And I could tell he had this blank stare, like a train. It was so obvious. So later that day, I called him. It's like, I saw you at the coffee shop. You seemed a little bit surprised. Is everything okay? And he said, actually, no, I had a really negative visceral reaction when I saw you. And I thought to myself, how can a pregnant person run a dating company? And so that just confirmed everything that I had been thinking. So we, and and that was now like 10 plus years ago. So there weren't very many female founders out there at the time. But that was very much the bias. Years later, I found myself going out to raise another round of funding and I was pregnant again. Mm -hmm. My timing's not the best. (laughs) and (laughs) That's how it usually is. (laughs) (laughs) So I decided not to hide it this time. I thought we have the metrics Mm -hmm. to prove that we're a successful company. I am not hiding this pregnancy. I walked into every meeting, tight dresses, rocked my belly. Let's go. And no one would give me funding. The only people who invested either knew me from before or only spoke to me over the phone. I had these meetings where I would Zoom with male investors and they would ask, they're like, oh, you're pregnant. Stand up and twirl around. Let me see your belly. Mm -hmm. And some said, I'm interested, but why don't you have the baby and we can talk after. So again, it was a struggle to raise the funds pregnant. My heart hurts so much. I'm just so sad to hear that because I don't think much has changed. I I don't. The good thing is we have more female investors now. I do think that's that's an improvement. I think the change that happened is that there's more female investors that are knowing our power and they're just like, okay, great. You're pregnant. That's amazing. Okay. And here's the investment because- Literally, moms are superheroes. Yes. And if there's anybody that you want to invest in, it is a a mother. Yes. Because we will make we it happen. Do it all. We know how to get deadlines done. Like we know how to meet deadlines. We know how to be efficient. We know how to balance. We know. I mean, we're, even if we're stressing ourselves out, yes. we get it we done. We get the job. And people would ask, "Well, what <sighs> happens when you have the baby?" And I would say. I have 50 babies that I take care of at three day rule. I have all my employees. They are my children too. Right. But it was, it was rough. Again, that was years ago. I do think we are making progress and I see more badass women who are founders and raising families. So I think we are making progress, but it's slow. It's hard. It's so hard. What would you say is your best piece of advice for me? I'm an entrepreneur. I wear many hats and I'm a mom. I'm a new mom. Our baby, 17 months. Uh, So we are in the thick of things. Best piece of advice for me when it comes to balancing 
my life. Yes. My career has been everything for me mm -hmm. and it continues to be everything while also now realizing I am responsible <laughs> for our child. And, you yes. know, we want to be the best in everything. We want to be the best parent and we also want to be the best in our career. Yeah. Best piece of advice for me. My advice is whatever you decide to do, that is the best decision. You want to go to the soccer game? That was the best choice. You mm -hmm. want to skip the soccer game and do some work? That was the best choice. And don't second guess yourself. Like just be present and know mm -hmm. that was the right decision for you. I love that. Do you feel like that advice has helped you be the successful founder that you are while also being an incredible parent. It does help. Mm -hmm. I don't feel guilty like I used to. So if I'm showing up for my kid, I know that that is the right move and I will get my work done at <laughs> 11 o'clock or 6 a.m. Like it will get done. And so right. I don't feel guilty anymore about like spending those precious moments with them. I also read that you turned some investors down because they weren't the right fit for your company. That must have been a hard decision because, listen, I yes. understand <laughs> the the need for needing funding, mm. right? Like we need it. Obviously, we're raising for a reason, right? We're not here because we want to be. So what were some of those things that you're just like, it's not a good fit for us? The investors are in a very important part of your business. Mm -hmm. Because later down the line, when you get acquired or like mm -hmm. you want to be able to trust those people or if something doesn't go right with the company, you want to make sure that they have your best interest at heart. Money is not worth it unless it is mm. going to help you in the long run. So pairing with the right people that really fit your culture and your values and your mission yeah. is so important. And yeah. there will be other funds. You might not believe that right. in the moment when you're getting so many no's, but there are people who will believe in your mission and will invest and it, it's better to wait. I'm so happy for all of your success. Oh, I am you. rooting for you, cheering for you. And I think it's amazing that you have created an empire and you continue to work so hard at it and being an parent and, and, and being an, an amazing parent. That's it's not easy. It is not easy. It's You're a lot right. of work. Yeah. Okay. So before we wrap up, I just want some dating tips from you okay, because you sure. are the matchmaker yes. and this is what you do. Okay. How important is appearance on a first date? I would say it's very important on a first date. Are we vain? No, but you just have to show up. First of all, it doesn't have to be anything fancy, but you have to feel confident. So even if that means mm. you have two uniforms that you wear, but you feel confident in them, that's right. what you wear. But it is important. I'll tell you like a really short yeah. story. We had this guy that we were working with and he was wealthy, but he didn't want people to know that he was wealthy. He didn't want to wear his fancy fair. watches. Totally fair. But he would kept showing up in sweats. Mm -hmm. And so the women would say, I'm really interested. He's a really nice guy, but like the wardrobe was really throwing me off. So it really can make an impact. But again, it doesn't have to, you don't have to be fancy. You just have to feel confident showing up and being the best version of yourself. What are three red flags to look out for? Whatever the opposite of consistency is. <laughs> that. that. <laughs> consistency wins in the end. So if you're with someone and they say they're going to call at a certain time and they don't, um, or that you want to plan a date for a Saturday and they don't, like that is a huge red flag. Mm -hmm. Let me think. Personality trait. Like if somebody is really so into themselves and like sort of elitist and expecting this like right. perfect model and it's like for me, I don't really want to work with that person. Right. So a big red flag is if they're emotionally unavailable. What does that mean? It means they're not ready and willing to commit right. and like for some reason they are not ready to be in a relationship. Mm -hmm. So you see that a lot on the apps. They're like dating multiple people. And again, if it's not the right fit, they're out. They're not ready to go all in with someone. Makes sense. And one last red flag. Sometimes like the charmers, like the people who are the most amazing daters are, act it's a red flag. Like they've been on so many dates, they know exactly what to say. And usually those are the oh. ones that don't show up for the second date. They're not interested. Yeah. Oh, another huge red flag is love bombing. You go on a date with someone and they're like, oh my God, you're so beautiful. Let's get married. Let's go on yeah. a vacation next week. Like it's too much too soon for the level that you're at. Right. And so that's called love bombing and people are deceived. They think oh, I met my person and everything's perfect, but then they don't hear from them again. 
Why does someone do the love bombing? Do you know why? Like what, like what's, what are they trying to do? It feels good. It boosts their ego. Sure. And so they want that connection. Maybe they want something from you that night. Right. They're like, <laughs> <laughs> um, but usually the love bombers, you, you don't even end up on a second date. You think everything's amazing and you've met your person and you call your family and then they're gone. Oh, and they ghost you. And they ghost you. Wow. Okay. All right. Any safety tips before going out on a first date? Mm -hmm. Well, you should always meet in public. Okay. That's for sure. And you can tell a friend where you're at right. and what time you're going at. And that you'll check in with them after. Mm -hmm. You can even have friends track you. Yes. But always meet in public for, for a sure. first date. Okay. When should someone say, I love you in a relationship? <laughs> I read that it should be after three months. Now that could just, you mm -hmm. know, listen, there's different, I'm sure research done, but on average, whatever this article was, they were talking about how I love yous are exchanged roughly around the three mm -hmm. month mark. And yeah. usually the guy's the first one to say it. Is there any truth to this in your experience? Well, three months sounds about right. Three, four, five, six months. I mean, it should be when you genuinely feel that you right. like the person and not yeah. yeah. But again, there are no rules in dating. So maybe you fall in love and you really feel after the first month you love them. That's fine. Right. There's no like set time, but three months, four months, five, like that sounds about right. Sounds about right. Yeah. Okay. By the way, my husband wouldn't say it and we had been dating like six months. And so eventually I turned him, I go, when are you going to tell me you love me? And he's like, oh, oh my God, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I love this confidence. You know, like, so our friends would tell us, don't do that. But you yeah. listened to your gut and you did that. Because I knew he loved me. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> okay, so how long should someone wait to text or call someone after a first date? So even though I do truly believe there are no rules, it should be within 24 hours. 24 hours? You within 24. Within? So you go on a date and then yes. you can text after to say I had a really nice time, like looking forward to meeting again, or it could be the next day, but I wouldn't wait any longer than 24 <gasps> hours. Wow. Okay. We need you. This is why <laughs> what you do is important. Okay. And what do you think about this? Can one night stands turn into a long lasting relationship? Yes, but it's incredibly rare. You are, you will have a much higher chance of success if you wait. Okay. All right. So what you're saying, there is a chance. There is a chance. <laughs> <laughs> if it happens, don't beat yourself up. It yeah. can still work out. But if you can hold out, you'll have a higher chance of success. Talia, I'm obsessed with you. Thank you so much for being here today and helping us. Marcy, did you learn a lot? I learned a lot. Talia, thank you so much oh, for you. just uh -huh. your amazing energy and the work that you do mm -hmm. and like believing in love and also just taking the time and your experience and just the energy that you are putting out there to help mm -hmm. people find that person in their life is so amazing. Mm -hmm. And I love that you're winning. I love uh -huh. it. I love to see women win. And um, maybe I'm just softer now that I'm a mom. <laughs> so I have a soft spot for mothers. But I love the work that you're doing. Mm -hmm. And I'm so appreciative for you to be here today. Oh, thank you. So nice. Thank, thank you, you so much. Yes. <laughs>